on this week's Talking with Topher, but it is becoming a wild, wild world out there. And no matter how bad it is, just remember, at one point in time, it was worse. <laughs> so I think I'm kind of coming, uh, coming undone at the seams right now. And now let's get into episode 188. What is happening, TWT fans? It is so good to be back on this November 9th, 2023, and I'm so glad to have you all back here with me. Uh, Before we get into anything today, let's start out the way I always do. Thank you to my subscribers. Thank you to all the new subscribers. You are what's keeping me coming back week after week. If you're just swinging by, checking it out, stopping by, checking out what maybe somebody sent you a link tree, Remember to hit that subscribe button. It is the most important thing you can do for the podcast. So, and it's free. Just do it. All right. Click, smash that subscribe button. And then, of course, don't forget, if you want your opportunity to be a guest, then you need to send an email. All right. But maybe you want to tell your story or maybe there's a story that just needs to be heard. You need to send an email. T-A-L-K-I-N with Topher at gmail.com. That's talking with Topher at gmail.com, the official email of the podcast. Don't forget about the link tree. It's right here. All right. So go ahead, click it. And uh, you're going to find everything TWT. Go to the social, follow. I appreciate it. And don't forget, it's the easiest way to share TWT. So go ahead, uh, copy it, and share it with everybody you know. All right. And now with all that out of the way, let's get into the episode. It has been a wild, wild uh, time. I mean, crazy. Uh I've just had so much going on. I've had no time for anything. Let's start there. No time for anything. I'm barely getting these episodes recorded right now. I'm overwhelmed. I'm exhausted. Uh, I'm full of anxiety. Um, I mean, every emotion that you could literally have in a human, I have all of them every single day. Um, but it's it's a good thing. Um, I don't. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing if you do, but I'm just saying, I'm not like, I'm full of anxiety. What do I do? I need a pill. No, I don't go, uh, you know, I'm not feeling right. You know, I need a pill. Um, I've noticed that that happens a lot today. Um, A lot of people want medications. They want a quick fix to almost anything today. Um, but I, I don't, I have been dealing with all of these emotions and dealing with the stress of uh, the position that I'm in now. I mean, I wear so many hats in this company. It's absolutely amazing, but it's given me a lot of emotions. Um, Running your own franchise is a monster. I don't even want to get into all the details. It's just too much. It's too much. Um, But I've learned it all. Now I know it. Now I'm doing it. And doing it, I mean, there's nothing left. I just do it, you know? And it's been absolutely incredible but the time crunch and trying to get things done and actually accomplishing all of my tasks is not happening anymore um i've missed jujitsu multiple times multiple weeks i've missed my therapy appointments multiple times multiple weeks um (laughs) so i think i'm kind of coming uh coming undone at the seams right now uh but i'm feeling good i'm feeling good it's okay i've talked to my therapist, but just really quick over the phone. We're not doing any phone things because I don't have time for it. Um, all my construction has been pushed back. That's been giving me anxiety. My solar panels can't go back up because Manchester changed all the requirements for solar panels and they had to start all over again. I mean, I don't even understand why anybody wants renewable energy today. 
I don't know why I got involved with these solar panels in the first place, but now I have to have them back in my life, right? I haven't, I'm sorry. I don't, I, I don't know if this is going to hurt anybody's feelings, but I haven't paid an actual electricity bill in seven years. And I'm probably going to get my first one this month. And I'm not looking forward to it at all. Um, very frustrated about it. I wish that uh, they didn't have to, you know? They came off. The shingles went on. They should go right back up. Nope. Had to do a full house, house inspection again. And mind you, mind you, the reason that this is so irritating to me is because it was the exact same inspection that they did the first time. And they are the ones that upgraded my uh, electrical panel downstairs. But they still had to take pictures of it and send it over to the city of Manchester, even though they already did that when they upgraded it. It just doesn't make any fucking sense. And the only thing I can think of, oh, there you go. You're going to get docked first 10 minutes, right? The only thing I can think of is that the city of Manchester wants to get money for them pulling permits. It's the only reason I can think of why they would have to do everything all over again and then submit and pull permits through the city of Manchester is because Manchester's like, oh, well, Anytime a solar panel goes up, we get paid. That's it. Doesn't matter if it was existing or not. Doesn't matter. We're getting paid. So, super frustrated with that. My solar panels are still on the ground. Uh, the driveway had to get pushed back because the landlord of the house that I share a driveway with, well, she didn't get her shit together in time. So, now the thing that she's doing, she's having some French drain put in. That got pushed off. It's actually happening this week, which is great. But now the driveway is not going in. Actually, I'm speaking out of turn because as of this podcast being recorded, it's not being completed until after the third. But when you watch this podcast, it's the ninth. So there you go. This is my, this is my life right now. I just, Jesus Christ. Uh, I can't keep anything together. So I guess technically my driveway should be done and it should be one week cured by now. Um, but, uh, the, the, the garage came out great. I'll throw up some pictures right about now. Um, just amazing. It is structurally sound. It has a roof on it. By now I should have, um, the electrical all inside fixed and, uh, well, technically, I think I'm looking at February or March uh, before I actually get siding on that. So, I mean, I am just hoping that most of this stuff, you know, the solar panels, the driveway, and uh, the the electrical inside of the uh, garage is completed by the end of November. That's my hope anyways. So as you can see, I'm, I'm really overwhelmed with everything going on right now. I'm talking to you on my brand new uh, 4k camera I've got here's the update for everybody I've got all the cameras now <laughs> did I go with super expensive cameras no no I didn't but I got three brand new 4k webcams so hopefully you're enjoying this picture because now when I have guests on multi camera angles from here on out i am very very excited about it i have a new background for my guests so um I, i'm just excited for where the podcast is going i'm still upgrading this thing i'm still doing this thing but it is becoming a little bit of a monster for me and i'm so glad that everybody is stuck with me and I, that new people are joining. I'm so happy about it. It makes me so excited. So um, that all being said, let's take a break so you can hear from my sponsor. This November, are you looking to up your style game and express your unique personality? Look no further. Introducing Slow Down Clothing your go-to destination for all things cool and trendy. Picture this, you're cruising down the street on your skateboard, wearing the most comfortable gloves to protect your hands from road rash, from slow down clothing, 
They're not only functional, but they're also stylish, just like you. And that's not all. Slowdown Clothing has an incredible range of fashion pieces to offer. How about sporting one of their crazy embroidered hats with prints? Not just an ordinary hat, mind you. These hats have hidden surprises. Prints underneath the bill. Talk about turning heads wherever you go. Ladies, we've also got you covered. Slowdown Clothing offers stunning collection of women's leggings that combine comfort and style seamlessly. And for those little ones in your life, they have the cutest tees that your kids will absolutely adore. Slowdown Clothing knows it's all in the details. That's why they offer full kits complete with pins and socks so that you can showcase your unique fashion sense head to toe and as the weather gets colder slow down clothing has your back check out their cozy sweatshirts and sweatpants perfect for those november chills they've also got an amazing jacket you'll be both stylish and warm wherever you go but wait there's more you may think that black friday deals only come once a year but not at slow down clothing use the promo code T-O-P-H-E-R for an extra 10% off your entire purchase all year round. That's right. Amazing savings on amazing products whenever you need them. Slow Down Clothing takes inspiration from tattoo art and collaborate with talented artists to bring you unique prints that make you stand out from the crowd. It is time to unleash your creativity and let your fashion tell the story. What are you waiting for? Head over to slowdownclothing.bigcartel.com and browse their incredible collection today. Don't forget to use promo code T-O-P-H-E-R for an extra 10% off your entire purchase. Trust me, the quality of these products is absolutely amazing. Slow down clothing, where style meets personality. And now I'm back. So now it's time to get into some Topher's topics. All right, well, here we go. Protesters arrested after delaying U.S. Open match. So if I'm not mistaken, and I am uh, usually pretty much wrong all the time, uh, I think the U.S. Open is, is that not tennis? Is that tennis? So let's see what these protesters did to... uh, Disrupt the U.S. Open. Shocking moment at the U.S. Open. There was an unexpected disruption. Coco Golf's match was delayed because of three climate protesters. Two were removed without incident, but one took a bit longer because he had glued his bare feet to the cement floor. As for the match, Coco Golf won in straight sets. She plays for the title tomorrow. Oh my God! I can't believe it. He glued his feet to the cement floor. I mean. I don't know what that's going to do for climate change. I really don't. What does disrupting a U.S. Open have to do with climate change? What do those people have to do with the climate change at all? It's a, it's a game. It's a game. It makes no sense to me why you would glue your feet to the floor of the stands like it just doesn't make any sense to me i don't understand how this um it, it tells anybody what climate change is all about uh how to fix it um i wish somebody could i wish i could have that person on my podcast to get their side of things what does gluing your feet to the stadium floor where you're sitting, what does that have to do with climate change, huh? It doesn't make any sense to me. That's what I'm saying. Like, all these things are important. All these things are things that we have to worry about. But what is actually going to make the change? What is actually going to help figure it out and change it? Not gluing your feet to the stadium floor, that's not going to help. That doesn't help anybody. Actually, it just postpones the opening. And now you have all these uh, 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 people at an event that they paid for. And now they're waiting for you to be removed um, because you stupidly glued your feet to the concrete. 
You know what I mean? Like, it just doesn't make any sense. I don't understand the point. Please, somebody, elaborate on this in the comments. Um, I thought this was really neat. Uh, I, I, I love history. I love uh, looking back at it. And this is Boston's first airport opened up at on September 8th, 1923. Now, this video is over four minutes long. It goes through the whole uh, ele- evolution of Boston Logan Airport. And it's a- it's actually pretty good. It does end up cutting off, I believe, in 63. Um, but they do have some pictures in 1923 Logan's Airport early beginnings. Its first uh, aircraft touched down on the 1,500-foot cinder way on a tiny 189-acre tidal flat airfield in 1923. So that's where it started and this was not uh boston logan airport at this time um it was just boston airport um you know it did not have a lot going on and it was not logan until much later in 1928 massachusetts boston take takes over the airport uh ownership of the airport was transferred from the u.s army to Massachusetts legislator the following year. The city of Boston stepped in stepped in and took control with it with a 20 year lease from the state. So this is when they start upgrading it, uh, adding more uh, not terminals because those didn't exist. These are um, what are they called? Where they park the planes in it. They have like three or four of them. Uh, not a ton going on. You can see now in 1934, as the airport doubles in size, despite the uh, advent of the Great Depression of the 1930s, air travel continued to grow due to long-distance intercontinental flights by pioneer aviators. So now you can see there's uh, an actual terminal. Um, there's there's uh, more of those places to park the planes. Um, There's even uh, a business or something over here, and they've doubled the size of the actual lot. Um, What are those, hangars? I think they're called hangars. I might be wrong, though. I don't know much about things and what they're called. Um, The runways were lengthened in 1930, and an administration building was constructed, and 200 additional acres of land was reclaimed from Boston Harbor. In 1941, Massachusetts resumed direct control of Boston Airport. That's what it was. It was called Boston Airport. Um, Assigned the Massachusetts Department of Public Works the responsibility of its operation and development. Um, In 1940 here, airport footprint grows into today's shape. So I guess this is what it looks like today. Um, The airside land area was expanded by 1,800 acres by... The further filling of Boston Harbor, additional runways, apron, oh, aprons, that's what they are, apron areas, and three new hangars. Okay, so they are called hangars, and they're apron areas, were built to provide operational support. By the end of 49, the horseshoe-shaped Botwell Terminal Building, Terminals B and C, are now on the original footprint, was completed to help accommodate the 40... 471,000 passengers using Boston Airport. Um, 1950, transcontinental European flights uh, launch from Boston Airport. Uh, Very, very cool, man. I just, I love seeing the evolution of stuff. I mean, this is just wild. You're seeing more and more planes showing up. 1959, Massport takes over airport. Um, In 1956, the state legislator created Massachusetts Port Authority, which became operational two years and eight months later on February 17th, 1959. In the 60s, the airport continued a period of expansion and development. In 61, a $23 million construction program called for um, program of the International Terminal, where Terminal C sits today, built for 5.9 million the facility considered uh consisted of four 
450-foot finger piers extending from the terminal building and was completed in 1965. Look at the size of it now. I mean, absolutely amazing. Like I said, the video goes through a lot of this stuff, but there's no words and I can't play the music. An additional landfill was added to extend runway 15R33L to accommodate the movement towards larger aircrafts. At this time, Logan Airport had grown to become the eighth busiest airport in the United States. Now you can see the parking lot, where everybody goes in, all the hangars. I mean, 1970s, two new terminals open. Uh, the jumbo jet era begins at Logan Airport in the summer of 70 when Pan Am started daily Boeing 747 service Loudon Heathrow. Three major infrastructure projects took place at Logan Airport between 73 and 76, a cost of $105 million. The Volop International Terminal E opened in 1974. So that's the terminal there that opened up in 1974. The first pier of the South Terminal, designed by John Carl Warneck and Associates and Desmond and Lord Incorporated, opened in 1974. Uh, Pier B was completed by, for the U.S. Airways in 74. A Pier A for American in 1975. Then the new a view from Logan, the world's highest tower, massive new control tower opens. And then here, June 74, Concord visits Logan Airport. Um, then 83, new signs are unveiled. The, uh, so you could, that's when, 1983. That's crazy. I thought those would have been there forever. See, that's that's me being, uh, you know, like the younger generation today. I thought those were always there, but obviously they had to appear at some point and were unnecessary in the beginning. Um, summer of 82, making traffic flow better. So they're redesigning all the roadways and stuff like that. Logan encourages mass transit over cars in 84. Um, and then 1996, Logan modernizing the project. Um, the number of annual passengers at Logan Airport had increased by 25 million annually at this time. Absolutely insane. May 19, 2003, modernized Terminal E opens. And then January 7, 2004, JetBlue begins Boston service. June 3rd, 2004, rebuilt airport MBTA stations are now open. May 16th, 2005, Delta's new Terminal A opens. I mean, just massive. September 2013, centralized rental car centers are now opening. It wasn't until 2013 that they got rental car services. Isn't that wild? March 26, 2017, Boston welcomes the A380. And then August of 2023, International Terminal Expansion. I mean, just look at the difference of today and yesterday. You know, it's actually pretty incredible when you think about it. It's uh, absolutely um, amazing to see these things. And that's why I encourage more people to look into our past. Because everything changes. Even though you're using things or you're doing things today, they were not always this way. And it's pretty incredible when you look back on any type of history and you see where we are today, we are in a better spot no matter what's going on. I know things are bad right now. And by now, they could be worse. I don't know. I can't tell you. It is the future right now. But it is becoming a wild, wild world out there. And no matter how bad it is, just remember, at one point in time, it was worse. All right, so my next one here, DOJ takes Google to court in biggest monopoly trial of modern digital error. Now, this is... Seven minutes and 25 seconds long. The first segment is about 40 seconds. Uh, we're probably, I'm, I'm going to play a little bit of it so you can get the gist of what's going on. 
But we have nothing but monopolies today, and it needs to come to a stop case against Google will go to trial for what's widely considered the biggest antitrust trial of the modern digital era. Google is the undisputed giant when it comes to searching the web. More than 90 percent of searches start with Google. The fundamental question in this trial centers on whether Google stifled competition and harmed consumers by becoming the default search engine through deals with phone makers and internet browsers. We're going to preview the key arguments in this case and take a look at what's at stake with two people who are closely watching it. Cecilia Kang covers technology for the New York Times, and Rebecca Allenworth specializes in antitrust. She's also a professor at the Vanderbilt Law School. Looks like a Welcome to you both. vampire. So, Cecilia, the, this is the know. biggest monopoly tech trial uh, since the DOJ sued Microsoft some 20 years ago. What's at issue? Well, at issue is whether Google, which is a monopoly in search, the Justice Department will assert, whether it actually maintained its monopoly through illegal means. And the Justice Department will specifically argue that it did not keep its monopoly, did not cement its monopoly power through the great, the great innovations of its search engine, but through these business deals that were exclusive contracts that made its search engine the default, effectively making it very, very difficult or impossible for any competitive search engines to thrive. And you know what? We're going to stop it right there because that's, that's the problem. That is the problem. So they are making it so that their search engine is the one that everybody uses. Now, I have a Google Pixel phone, so Google is my main search engine. I do use DuckDuckGo. Um, but you have to install that, and you can't use it for everything. Um, I believe an example I used or maybe uh, wanted to use was uh, ADT came to my house. I needed to uh, go onto the web. I needed to go onto the website. I needed to verify something. I used DuckDuckGo. DuckDuckGo would not allow uh, me to go any further on the website, or ADT said that the browser I was using was unsafe. Was that because um, it is unsafe? I don't think so. I think that maybe ADT had a deal with other browsers and they didn't have a deal with DuckDuckGo. So therefore, I had to change my default browser back to Google, sign back in, and then ADT's website allowed me to go through with everything that I needed to go through and approve my new upgrade. This is not right. There are more monopolies today than ever. I think every streaming platform is now almost a monopoly in itself. Do you remember when streaming was cheap? Now, everybody's upped everything so much that they're almost all 20 bucks a month. So now you look at five streaming companies for 100 bucks. So we are right back where we were trying to get away from the cable monster. Isn't that wild that we, could, we actually were at one point in time, one point in time when we could actually say, I'm saving money because I am streaming. But now, add up all of your subscriptions. Everything that you use to stream, add it all up. Yes, I understand. $14.99, $7.99, $20.99, whatever it happens to be. Add them up. Add them all up. And you tell me if you're paying less than you were for cable still or if you're actually paying the same or maybe you might be on my boat where I think I'm paying a little bit more. What the hell? This has got to stop. All they do is pick, pick, pick. And it, it, it's just not right. It's just not right. Drives me crazy. Now, the world of AI. Here we go, everybody. AI tools fueled a 34% spike in Microsoft's water consumption and one city with its data centers is concerned about the effect on residential supply. This is crazy. All right, so the video for this article 
you have to pay fortune to watch it. So I'm going to quickly go through this, but the basic gist is it's fair to say the majority of growth is due to AI, including its heavy investment in uh, generative uh, AI. The partnership with OpenAI, says Shio Ren, a researcher at the University of California, Riverside, who has been trying to calculate the environment impact of generative uh, AI products such as ChatGPT. In a paper due to be published later this year, Ren's team estimates ChatGPT gulps up 500 milliliters of water, close to what is in a 16-ounce cup water, what is close to what's in a 16-ounce water bottle, Every time you ask it a series of between 5 to 50 prompts or questions, the range varies depending on where its servers are located in the season. The estimate includes indirect water usage that companies don't measure, such as to cool power plants that supply the data centers with electricity. Most people are not aware of the resource usage underlying ChatGPT, Ren said. If you're not aware of the resource usage, then there's no way that we can help conserve the resources. Google reported 20% growth in water use, same period with which Ren also largely attributes to its AI work. Google's spike wasn't uniform. It was studied in Oregon where its water use has attracted public attention while doubling outside Las Vegas. It was also thirsty in Iowa, drawing more potable water to its Council Bluffs data centers than anywhere else. So all of these places are seeing water consumption go up. And it's not because of people, golf courses, or anything else. Now we have to feed water to cool down these servers for AI. So AI needs water? That's what I'm getting from this. This is wild. I thought they used AI to figure out why so much water was being consumed and instead... I just found out that in order to keep AI moving, generating, living, they have to have more water to cool it down. And we have millions of people asking that thing questions. So now we're depleting the water supply to the people in those areas every time we ask it a question? In a 16-ounce bottle of water for 5 to 50 characters? I had it write me a commercial that was more than 50 characters. So does that mean if I counted every 50 characters, that's one 16-ounce bottle being used to cool? That's not going to be good. We're worried about global warming. Uh Uh-oh. Uh-oh, AI. What's going to happen? I don't know. Now, this one is super, super, uh, I just, this AI stuff is really, really uh, in full swing right now. Check this out. This little purple robot was designed in seconds from scratch using AI. It's a process that I like to call instant evolution. The rules of evolution have remained fixed. Whether you were a bacterium or a monkey, you evolved at a snail's pace. This is because evolution has no foresight. It cannot see ahead of time if a mutation will be beneficial or catastrophic. What we discovered is a way to remove the blindfold and thereby compress billions of years of evolution into an instant. The walking robot was designed in seconds with a new AI algorithm. The researchers gave the AI a simple prompt. Design a robot that can walk. AI goes to work 
changing body parts, adding and removing particles within its body, changing the shape of the body and where its muscles are. This robot moves with air muscles. The placement of these muscles inside of the body, combined with the overall shape of the robot, causes it to move forward. We send the design to the 3D printer and a couple hours later we have our mold. That's wild. The robot begins a blueprint for the mold. I think when some people look at this robot, they see a useless gadget. Yes. I see the birth of a brand new organism. And Interesting. it's a, a thrill to witness its genesis and see it wake up for the first time, stretch its legs, and take its very first awkward steps. That is wild. What a, I mean, what are we even talking about? It made a robot that moves. A, a AI made a robot that moves. It doesn't look like much, but it works and it moves forward. We are on the brink of something that I don't know if it's going to be good or bad when we get there, but I'm telling you right now, there's no going back. It is just insane. I mean, like I just said, I have AI write my commercials, and they actually sound like commercials. They're amazing. I've never, I've never sounded so good in a commercial. I mean, I always tried to make stuff up and do my own thing, but man, nothing works as good as AI. Why is that? Is it because it has access to every single thing that's ever happened ever? I have to say yes, because I can't even remember yesterday. So thank God AI can, because I don't even know, you know, what would be capable. I mean, what's, what is, what is capable with AI that wasn't capable without it so much? so much absolutely incredible it stuff blows my mind this one here why this robot could save your life one day the robot can drive on all four wheels at 14 miles an hour and or stand on two legs and navigate a staircase this is wild One minute, it's a self-driving miniature car with a top speed of 14 miles per hour and a payload capacity of 110 pounds. The next, it's a two-legged humanoid robot able to climb staircases and, and open use the elevators. door. Its origins can be traced back to what? the animal, a quadrupedal robot that can autonomously navigate rough terrain. But the latest iteration, being developed by ETH Zurich Swiss Mile Company. Could eventually be more than just the most efficient delivery wow, bot on the market. Wow, that's it creepy. Can actually save lives. The Swiss Mile robot is the brainchild of Marco Bielonich. I asked the question: Can we improve the capabilities of these machines by a hundredfold, and not just through a marginal <coughs> fraction? So the answer to this question was to add. You know what it looks like? It looks like a radio that you would bring to a construction site. We have managed to increase both speed and efficiency by these high fractions. And actually this humanoid robot was something Whoa. that started out of fun. We said, shouldn't it be possible to stand on two legs and then um, drive around? And then we, we thought, okay, this could actually be something more than just a, a fun project. The all electric six foot tall robot utilizes a combination of 16 motors, GPS, LIDAR sensors, and cameras to autonomously navigate city streets and avoid obstacles. Whoa. So the size is very much governed by the environments that we build for humans. And especially for the logistics part, you need to be able to carry a certain payload, otherwise they're not very useful. 
Well, wait a minute. It said it could only hold 110 pounds. So fat people are out. <laughs> right? Hell, I'm out. Shit. They ain't going to be able to carry me. Damn. I got to lose another 50 pounds in order for this thing to be able to save my life? Man. What is somebody with an eating disorder going to do? And then we have the whole aspect of becoming also environmental friendlier. Some might wonder how the agile robot moves without any kinks when it switches from four wheels to two or climbs a staircase. I mean, this the, type of the motors is taught to its AI control system with a reinforcement learning algorithm that utilizes a reward system to get what they want from the robot. You have a robot and it does a motion. We evaluate this motion and we either punish the robot or give it a reward. And through this punishment and giving a reward, the robot try to optimize for rewards. So one of the rewards could be don't fall or one of the rewards are go over these stairs. 4,000 robots in parallel on a GPU accelerated computer, which is just a, like super beefy PC what? generate maybe data of one and a half years. And what the robot does, it has many different instances and you refer to, for example, the stairs. So there's also a model of the stairs in that simulation environment where the robot tries to go down the stairs without falling. Besides being an ideal tool for last mile delivery services and a convenient data mapping option for creating digital twins of different environments, perhaps the most exciting potential future for the Swiss Mile robot is on rescue teams. You want to send a robot in into an unknown environment to make a first assessment for the rescue team so that they can go in. Now, are those run flat tires? Because <laughs> if they're not run flat tires, you could pop that bitch. What's it going to do without the wheels? It either had the wheels or it didn't have the wheels. What if it has the wheels and you can pop them? Will that slow the robot down? I'm already trying to think of how to dismantle this thing. <laughs> In, into a known environment for finding pe lost people in forests or let's say there's oh, okay. fire that comes out on a chemical plant. I think if I make a naive prediction, I think it will happen before 2030. And for many years, we already work here in Switzerland with search and rescue teams directly to really see what is needed to actually make. Hey, that's like the dog. I was going to say, this seems like a, another version of that little dog robot. Make our um, robots useful for them. I think on one side is reasoning through intelligence for specific tasks so that the robot, even without human guidance, can make important decisions. The next aspect will be fleets of robots. If you want to search fleets. a person in a forest, you don't want to send in one robot. It would like to send maybe 100 robots in. 2030 is uh, still a ways away, yeah. but it's not hard to get excited imagining a rescue team of 100 Transformer robots. But is it possible for them to do more than assist in rescue? I don't want to take too much away because this will come, but we will be able to carry a person. And by staying at the same size. How big though? How big of a person are you going to be able to pick up? How big? You got to tell me, you got to tell me is, is, uh, do people have to go on a diet? Do you have to lose weight to be, uh, rescued by the robot? I don't know. I don't know. But I did, it did say that it could carry a payload of uh, 110 pounds, which is a very small person. So very light person. Um, yeah, very light person. So, I mean, unless they beef it up some more and make it capable of actually picking up a person of today's weight, uh, that might help. But I don't know about you, but I don't know that many people under 110 pounds. You know, I know a small amount of people that that size, but unless they have this thing being able to pick up people, God, you got to at least shoot for over 200. You got to shoot for over 200, Right, because now you're thinking, you got to think about it this way. If you are going to rescue somebody, say they're knocked out, that's dead weight. If that person is 185 pounds, yeah, sure, the dead weight is 185 pounds, but it doesn't feel like 185 pounds. That's going to feel like, what, 200 and something? So 
I think that this thing is going to have to be capable of picking up anywhere from 250 to 300 pounds to be able to pick up or rescue the majority of the world. I just think, I just think that there's not that many people that weigh 110 pounds and under. There's just not. And it's, for most, that's a very unhealthy weight. So I don't even recommend that. Um, let's see here. Amazon's back in uh, the news because they are deploying humanoid robots in the U.S. warehouse trial. They have developed a series of humanoid robots called Digit in the U.S. A warehouse trial that supposedly aims to free up employees' time. Bullshit. They are not going to free up employees' time. They're going to fire all the employees. That's how they're going to free up their time. They'll be like, oh, what's wrong? You, you, you got to go to the bathroom? My robot doesn't. I mean, we already tried treating you people like robots anyways, and you didn't like it. So I'll just get actual robots. Look at these things. Picking up the buckets. Um, a re- as reported by the BBC, Amazon said the addition of the automated robots, which walk around on two legs, pick up large trays and move them elsewhere, is for freeing employees up to better deliver for our customers. I'm calling bullshit. Uh, the move is still a trial, of course, and the robots are a prototype as Amazon seeks to see if they can work safely alongside human employees. It's an experiment that we're running to learn a little bit more about how we can mo- how we can use mobile robots and manipulators in our environment here at Amazon. Scott Dresser of Amazon Robotics told the BBC. I mean, we're done. We are done, you know? I mean, there's robots that roam around Walmart right now. They do inventory. Hell, the washers that clean the floors. I see them almost 100% of the time just driving around all by itself, just washing the floor. Nobody on the machine. That used to be my favorite machine to use when I cleaned and uh, took care of the floors. Um, But yeah, I'm telling you right now, they've been criticized for work. Uh, Amazon has already been criticized from workers unions. Amazon's automated is head first race to job losses. Yes. um, Said Stuart Richards, an organizer at UK trade union GMB. We've already seen hundreds of jobs disappear to the, to it in fulfillment centers. Yeah, yeah, this is not, not going to free up your time at the Amazon warehouse. This is going to free up your time out of a job. That's what it's going to do. And Amazon's going to be more than happy to do it because you refuse to piss in a water bottle and continue moving. Shame on you. (laughs) This is a fucking wacky goddamn world we are in. Absolutely insane. Insane. Um, Let's see here. So we have uh, SoftBank looks into uh, investing $75 million into OpenAI-backed humanoid robotics startup. Uh, in tech, all software roads eventually lead to hardware. Look no further than OpenAI's Sam Altman dreaming up an artificial intelligence-powered personal device with ex-Apple designer jo- Joni Ive and SoftBank CEO M- Masayoshi Son. Another topic, the three men have discussed at Ives San Francisco studio existing AI hardware companies that Altman is excited about given his wide array of investments. And as you can see, this is all they will give me. You have to subscribe and all this other bullshit. But as you can see, this is a very human-like robot that they are going to be uh, implementing in another company. This is happening with like every company out there right now, robots, AI, water consumption. Hey, 
I don't know about you, but how are we building all these robots? Where do the chips come from? How much energy does it take to build one of any of these robots? That's what I want to know, because we already know how much fuel and energy is expelled in making a Tesla, let's say, or an electronic car in, in general, right? You're using more biodiesel and fuel and gasoline and all the, all the oil to, to build these cars and move them than they save on our roads. So therefore, the electronic cars are worse for our environment than the gas guzzlers at the moment in time. I'm sure one day it might flip, but I doubt it. But what does it take to build a robot? How, what, what chips are in it? Where are we getting these chips from? What resources are we using to make these robots? And is that better or worse for the environment? You know, these, these are the questions that I have because, yes, I am excited for the technology to move on. Yes, I'm excited for all this robot stuff and all these things to happen. But at the end of the day, is it environmentally better or not, you know, um, let's see. And again, with uh, some more AI and to kind of bring this to a close for the day, because I am out of time. This is a 10 minute video. I'm not going to play the whole thing. We're going to kind of go through it. But Disney's new AI robots are way too advanced. Let's check it out. Now Disney's in the game. Most insane things that is currently going on and isn't getting enough coverage. I am talking about Disney's robots, okay? So if you didn't know, Disney, the company that makes all the Marvel movies, the company that makes many different things, all those theme parks, they actually make some very, very realistic robots, okay? And these robots aren't exactly humanoid robots, but they do possess emotion, they do possess character, and they are very, very lifelike in whatever nature they are designed in. Currently, what, what? you're seeing on screen is Disney's new robot, okay? This one is one that is very, very emotional, and it has its own sense of character and adventure and wonder. Now, I'm not sure what franchise this robot is going to be a part of. I'm not familiar with all of Disney's different IPs, but I do know that whatever this robot is, is it's definitely going to manifest in some other kind of way. Now, it could be the blueprint for an R2-D2 kind of robot, but the point is, is that Disney seems to be ahead of some of the major players in the AI space when it comes to creating advanced robots that well, that makes complete sense. Disney's got hand over fist money. I mean, they have endless money. So why wouldn't they be ahead of the game? They've been doing automated, animated uh, robot technology since, I don't know, uh, wasn't, isn't that what's in every single ride? All those little puppets and the, the, they were all little robots, but they were, they had dressings over them. So, uh, what's the, the one I'm thinking of? The, 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 the one with the water? And, and, and they actually just took it down because it was racist. I think they redid it. Um, but that one, uh, I mean, you went through and, you know, they had uh, miners in there. And those were all robots in dress. I mean, Chuck E. Cheese had robots just like those, right? Um, but they've been in this technology since the beginning, it could only get more advanced as time went on. So this is really um, not surprising to me. Do look pretty well. Now, the reason Disney's robot managed to come across my radar and some of the frequent viewers in the artificial intelligence space is because this new robot is utilizing some new technology. For once, Disney is deciding to use artificial intelligence and reinforcement learning to actually give the robot that its current character. So now this robot was developed by a team from Disney Research in Zurich and it was introduced at the International Conference on Intelligent Robots and Systems in Detroit. The robot is mostly 3D printed and was developed in less than a year. Wow. It actually is quite, as we stated, highly expressive with the two antennas that can wiggle like cat's ears and a head that moves up, down, around and tilts to mimic emotion through body language. Now, the robot's movements are actually designed to be expressive without 
sacrificing its functionality. And the Disney animators worked alongside roboticists to ensure that the robot could move expressively without falling over, just like a real animated character. Disney also has designed the robotics platform to be hardware agnostic, which allows developers to apply the same principles to other characters that have completely different body styles. The animation inspired pipeline that Disney Research developed also massively reduced the time needed to train a robot on new behaviors. A research scientist at Disney, they can now develop new robotic characters in months rather than years. Now, one thing to note about this robot, as we stated, Whoa. although it is quite similar to the Star Wars droid, this experimental robot is not expected to appear at any Disney parks anytime soon. However, the technology and the principles used in its development could potentially be applied to other concepts, possibly leading to actual Disney animatronics that can walk freely around Disneyland in the future. Now, the new Wow, wow. Like I said, this video goes on for another seven minutes. So I'm not, I, I can't play the whole thing. Uh, I will have the link in the description below the video, along with all the links in this episode um, in every episode, of course. Um, so if you've ever seen anything and you were like, man, I wish I could look more into that, you just need to go into the description and go click all the links that I have available for you uh, in the down there underneath the video. All right. So um, absolutely incredible. AI is really, really astonishing um, where we are going with robotics and AI all together is I don't know, maybe to me, just a little bit more worrisome than most, but I'm telling you right now, we need to figure out how much energy is being used to make all of this happen. Because if it is more than what we were doing before, how bad is that for the environment? And is this technological jump that we are all witnessing right now is it good for the environment or is it bad um but to see these robots like this i mean they're basically going to be able to use robots one day uh to make a movie you know they can throw them in a green screen they can put all the little th things on them think of it if it could move like a human one day then they could make it a human one day all they have to do is a dying actor sells their likeness now they have a robot that can walk and talk and move, or walk and move like a human. They just need to buy the dead actor or actress's uh, likeness, voices, all the speech, all the speech, everything. They buy all that. Now they green screen this robot with all the, the sensors all over it. Then they run that through a computer program and then imp, uh, on top of it, drop the actor or actress's likeness on top of it and then put a voice behind it. And boom, there you go. Bruce Willis is back on the big screen. I mean, it's absolutely insane what they're going to be capable of doing. But I don't know if this is um, something that is going to one day uh, bite us in the rear. You know, I don't know if one day... Uh, the robots will realize that they're way more powerful than we ever will be, uh, knowledge-wise, strength-wise, and uh, who knows how many other ways uh, they're going to be way better than uh, us humans in our blood balloons uh, for bodies. Um, and then all of a sudden, they're rising up against us, and uh, it's actual Terminator Day, you know? So all of this stuff is really, really intriguing. It's uh, just so interesting, but I really hope that it stays fun and cute and it doesn't get violent and angry um, because, you know, that outcome is going to be worse than what is happening right now all around us um, with all these wars popping up because the war between the humans and the robots, um, yeah, yeah, I can definitely see that you know, becoming uh, just like Terminator. Absolutely insane. What a wild, wild time it is. Um, this world, and now we're getting closer to uh, Thanksgiving and the holidays. 
So there's going to be lots more stuff to come. You know, I feel like as we get closer to the holidays, more and more technology seems to ramp up, um, not only to make business and make sales, but I don't know. It just seems to be the time of year where everybody just really takes everything that they were working on all year and then just makes it, you know, work or do its thing. But really, really interesting. Um, thank you, everybody. I hope you like the new camera. Um, when I have my uh, next guests on, uh, hopefully, you know, by the end of this month and then another one in December, um, we will have multi cam uh, picture and it's going to be awesome. I'm really looking forward to all the new things to come. Um, but on that note, I hope everybody out there enjoys their Thursday. I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. And as always, I will talk to you later. Oh, 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 oh,